This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 126 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today we've got some really interesting stories to hear. We're talking about language difficulties when we travel. Now I have had plenty of language difficulties uh, over the time when I travel. Even when I think I know the language, it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't work out that way. And I'll tell you about some of those uh, moments in just a second. Um, but first up, I want to welcome this month's sponsor, the very awesome Awesome Maps. So as you can tell from their name, they make awesome maps. They make not just, you know, a map to, uh, uh, well, not a map to find your way, uh, not a map to help you out of a language difficulty even, but a map to inspire you. So one of their greatest range of maps is their activity maps. They've got world maps which show um, all of the amazing places around the world where you can, for instance, do diving or they have a golf map, a yoga map, a surfing map, a hiking map, and so on. And they're just delightful. We are currently waiting with bated breath, waiting for Australia Post, most likely, because uh, the Australian postal system is a bit average, um, waiting for our hiking map to arrive. I cannot wait to have it on the wall and be staring at it and planning some future trips. Uh, and now another thing I like about Awesome Maps is they're made by people pretty similar to me and to a lot of you Thoughtful Travel Podcast listeners too, I think. Um, the company's based out of Berlin, but uh, all the designers and developers and, and all the other staff, they work from all over the world. They're, um, the website tells me, and uh, one of my contacts there tells me they're based in places like Bali, Dubai, Spain, Portugal, and of course Germany. And many of the maps have been made on the road. So that's pretty cool. You know, they're fellow travellers like us. Um, and they're also so uh, very keen to share the joy of their maps with Thoughtful Travel Podcast listeners, and they have made a 15% discount code for us. So uh, their website for Awesome Maps is at awesome-maps.com, and if you choose any of their lovely maps, you can use the code AMANDA15 to get your 15% discount. So that's at awesome-maps.com. So back to some language difficulties when traveling. I don't know when, where to start with my stories. Um, but one that got me into well, sort of a little bit of trouble was when I thought I understood the language. So, uh, I speak German pretty well, but when I was living in Germany, I was living in the Southwest where they speak a particular dialect. Um, Swabian, I guess is the translation or Schwäbisch. And it's a dialect with a few little quirks and one of their, annoyingest quirks, I think, is they um, they have a particular way to tell the time and well, just just in some instances. And they have a um, a phrase for the time, for example, dry fear to zex, which if you just translate word by word is three quarters, six. And uh, this got me many times. So, you know, have a think for yourself. First of all, if you hear something that's like three quarters, six, what time is that? You know, is it uh, 6.45? Probably that's what I used to think. And I, But I knew it was tricky and I tried very hard to remember correctly. And I was meeting some lovely friends uh, at one stage going out, oh, I think to dinner. We didn't have like tickets for an appointment for any particular time, I think. So it must have been dinner, thank goodness. Um, but yes, we're supposed to meet at Dreifiertel Zex. Uh, and here I am thinking, I was thinking so confidently, oh yes, I remember now, dry fiddle is X, three quarters six, that means 6.45. And about 6.15, I got a call from these friends, uh, and they were, I mean, I don't know how they waited so long, but they were like, um, Amanda, where are you? Oh yeah, I'm on my way. I'm going to be a bit early. And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> and of course it turns out dry fiddle is X, three quarters six, is 5.45. So it's kind of like three quarters of the way to six o'clock. Uh, and to this day, whenever I hear someone describe a time that way, I have to stop and think so hard and think, oh yeah, okay, that time I was late. So it must be the earlier time. Therefore that's 5.45. But yeah, so that's just a one tiny example of my language difficulties. And that's even when, you know, I speak the language quite well, but they throw in a few 
bonus difficulties like that. Now, I did ask in the Facebook group for Thoughtful Travellers for some examples, and I have so many good ones that I'll have to save some for another episode, um, but I've got to share a couple of them. So um, the lovely Norea from Spain shared an example that happened to a, a Spanish friend of hers, and she had actually, she's an orthopaedic surgeon, had received a grant to have a short stay in a hospital in Newcastle, um, and she, um, the friend turned up, um, so sorry, Newcastle in Australia. It's probably important to know. So her friend came along, um, was staying, uh, in a rented room, um, in a small house near the hospital. And, uh, the lady at the house welcomed her, um, and, you know, she'd arrived and she started, the lady started to make her some tea and they were chatting. And, um, this friend of hers had, uh, you know, very good English, but, you know, an accent got in the way as well. And so she's making her tea. And at some point, this lovely lady says to her, what's your specialty? Uh, because she knew that the friend had come to work at a hospital. But um, <laughs> because um, this friend hadn't had much experience with the Australian accent and, you know, she was watching her, you know, make a cup of tea, she thought, what's your specialty? She was thinking, what's your special tea? You know, the drink. And unfortunately, she answered, uh, well, I prefer black ones. And the lady stared at her and said, you know, black ones? And I suppose, uh, and Nero supposed that this lady thought that their friend meant, you know, um, people of colour, black patients, and was very puzzled and thinking, you know, what kind of strange and racist Spanish girl she was going to be sharing her house with. Um, and apparently shortly after they discovered this misunderstanding and they had a great laugh. So, um, yeah, so it's another case, even when you know the language well, sometimes that you can get uh, stuck from an accent. Um, Sandra Muller also shared a short story that was... Um, really unfortunate for her. So she was, uh, you might remember her from some of the episodes when she was living in Korea, in South Korea, and she was teaching uh, Korean kindy kids and teaching them English, but, you know, using some Korean words to give them instructions. And apparently uh, the number 18 in Korean sounds very similar to a terrible swear word in Korean. Um, so kind of the equivalent of the F word. And, um, there's apparently two sounds, a but and a put sound there, easily mixed up, and the words are otherwise identical. So Sandra was teaching a classroom of 30 Korean kindy kids, and she asked them in Korean to open their books, and she wanted to tell them to open it to page 18, but she kept saying, uh, and she repeated the instruction, you know, many times to the effing page, <laughs> and she kept saying it because she thought she was saying page 18, and finally a little girl tugged on her arm and said that she was speaking bad words. <laughs> Um, she did not make that mistake again. And uh, certainly if I ever learn Korean, I'll be very careful about the number 18. Oh, my goodness. Um, so it's very easy to make these terrible mistakes. And um, very briefly, Lala, a friend of mine who lived in Thailand for some years, um, had a sort of a similar problem. Apparently the Thai word for scissors is close to the Thai word for underwear. So you can see this could be a problem. So when she was uh, many years ago as a young teacher in a small town um, outside of Bangkok, a bit more countryside, and um, she uh, needed to um, <laughs> needed to wrap a present for a friend and uh, didn't have any scissors. And she knew she was uh, at the shop, uh, the local, local stationery store, and the owner was a parent of one of her students. And so she went in to ask uh, for some scissors, and she accidentally said, um, excuse me, could I borrow your underwear, please? I need to wrap this present for a friend. Oh, so cringy. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of my favourite stories from what came out of our chat on the Thoughtful Travellers group uh, on Facebook. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed them. But now on to my guests who also have some very um, tricky experiences, uh, not just funny, but also just all of the things that can go wrong when you're having language difficulties when you travel. And my first guest today is Dean O'Shea, and he's new to the Thoughtful Travel podcast, and has lots of interesting stories to tell, as do all my guests. So Dean, um, among many other travels, has spent quite a time in China, and that's what we chatted about for this episode. I spent four months in China. Oh wow! And I visited. I think there are twenty. I think there are twenty-four main provinces. I visited thirteen. Oh, well done! I went all the way from 
Shanghai all the way down into the south through the west and up and all the way actually in, into Kazakhstan. Oh, awesome. And uh, yeah, during this time, basically the second I departed Shanghai, I was just kind of plunged into this world of, of difficulty <laughs> in terms of language. Mm -hmm. And it's it, difficult in, in different ways than you'd think. Um, mainly because <clears throat> in the Chinese language, intonation isn't mm. used in the same way. Yeah. So, you know, we can use our tones to be very expressive and, you know, get points across. But actually the way in Mandarin, intonations are used to accent meanings. Mm -hmm. So the same word said five different ways mean five, are five different words. Mm. So they tend, to, uh, in the Chinese language, they tend to speak quite flatly and bluntly. So you can never really tell what emotions they're expressing when uh, they're using their words. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's tricky. Yeah and, yeah, and they also don't use hand gestures. Uh -huh. um, you know, I'm, I'm a very handsy person, and mm. I've I found, you know, traveling all over the world, I can usually make myself understood by kind of tones and hand gestures. And, yeah, going this way, yeah, over here, and, like, this thing, it's a box, it looks like this. You know, but they, they, they just really don't do that, or that they just don't have that in their culture. Mm-hmm. In fact, they use their hands for different things. So there are symbols that they use for numbers and things like that. Uh, so that was the second difficulty. And then the third one was with the writing. So there are basically as soon as you depart the major cities, you won't see a, a word of, of English written anywhere. Uh -huh, right. Everything is in everything is in Chinese characters. So not only do you have to learn how to speak the language, you also have to learn how to read it. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up just never knowing what you're ordering in restaurants, <laughs> not being able to find places. And and it's a, it was just an incredible challenge. And even after four months of it, when I'd got all of the words for hotel, rooms, um, you know, travel, all these kind of things down, and I was quite confident with with getting around, uh, you know, even on my last day, I still walked into a hotel and couldn't manage to get a room because I just could not. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so frustrating. And you would expect um, that if a, a foreigner w walks into a hotel, they could probably guess that a room is what you're after. <laughs> yeah, it was just, uh, it, it was just tough. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, th th there were many times, uh, specifically in restaurants where I, I had funny experiences where, um, so I'd come in and <clears throat> there'd be no pictures on the menu, no English. It would just be mm. like a white sheet with lots of Chinese characters. <laughs> I'm like, right, okay, I got this. I know the uh, one that means chicken. Word. I'll find it. Yeah, exactly. So right, th so this symbol means chicken. This symbol means noodles. This symbol means soup. I don't know what that one means. <laughs> oh, well. I'm probably going to get a chicken noodle soup. Okay, let's just order it. And then I order it, and then it comes back. It's a chicken intestine soup. Oh, like, so ah. important to know that fourth character, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So now I know that that character means intestines. Okay. Mental note. Uh, that's. <laughs> I see that symbol. I'm not ordering that dish. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so yeah, it was it was things like that that um that just kind of get you or just take you by surprise, um and then other times as well when, for example, in different provinces in China they speak different languages. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's the one overarching language, which is Mandarin, but then basically every province has its own language. Mm -hmm. So uh, like Pudonghua, uh, Sichuanhua, um, you know, Yunnanhua, all these kind of languages. And some of them are wildly different. Some of them are subtly different. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so <laughs> funny enough, one of the words which is different in almost every province is the word for bus. Oh, that's inconvenient. It's like, is very inconvenient. <laughs> so, you know, I'd, I'd go to one province, I'd find out what the word for bus is, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, bus station, let's go here. Um, and funny enough, so the word chu, it means vehicle. So uh, a chi chu is a bus in, in most provinces. A hua chu is a train because the word hua means fire. Uh -huh. So it's a fire, it's a fire vehicle. And so, you know, originally when they had steam trains, that's <laughs> yeah. how they kind of like create the language. Right. Um, so, you know, you, I was, I was going along and in this one particular province, I think it was Yunnan. I just arrived there and I was trying to order a bus. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I was, I was speaking to a taxi driver trying to get, take me to the bus station. And I said, okay, can you take me to the bus station? Just blank face. It's like mm -hmm. bus, bus station. And then I, I listed off the five other words that I knew for bus. <laughs> and he just stared blankly at me, it just like with a, a huge vacant expression. He, obviously, he had no idea what I was talking about. I was like, what are you on about? 
like where and, and eventually i just walked um <laughs> like about half an hour and i find the, i found the bus station and uh i asked someone they were like oh yeah, it's a completely different word oh no it's like it's gong gong or something like that I was like, oh my god <laughs> you were never gonna guess that never gonna guess that no <laughs> Ah, oh, poor Dean and his experiences in China. It's, uh, I think, another of those examples that even when you know the language, you never know the language, and you go around the corner to a new province or a new part of a country, and it changes. It's really tricky, and it's weird for me to think that because here in Australia, um, it's, it, you know, we've got an enormously vast country. And there's very, very few words that change across Australia. Uh, famously, um, I call this weird processed meat polony, and people in the rest of Australia call it all different names. That's like one of the things. Or we call what we swim in bathers, and in other parts it's uh, swimsuit and stuff. But, like, that's literally pretty much the only differences we have. So um, I guess that's easier, at least, for other people. But, uh, yeah, in China, lots of lots of tricky language issues. So, um, yeah, I'll remember that when I get there someday. Now, my next guest today is Joanne Cards, and she has had some problems with Spanish and had uh, a few little incidents along the way that have been quite entertaining, in retrospect, at least. I've been learning Spanish for a number of years, but early on, it's quite easy to make mistakes. There's words, words that sound the same and, you know, they, they mean different things. So <laughs> we, were, we were on a train journey in northern Spain. It was a lovely train journey. We were the, with a group of um, Aussies, but the other people were all Spanish. They weren't, they weren't any sort of people from other European or English-speaking countries. So we got chatting to them and um, got off the train and walking past down the station, and one of them was chatting to me, and he said, which one's your husband? So I wanted to say to him, it's the bald man over there. But I didn't know the word for bald. So I thought, well, how am I going to describe this? So (laughs) I'll try and describe it as the man with no hair because I knew, I thought I knew the word for hair. (laughs) But in the end, I said, um, I know that it's that man over there, the man with no skin. Oh, no. The people that I was talking to, they just cracked up laughing. And I said, what did I say? What did I say? They wouldn't tell me. They were too embarrassed to tell me. I sort of back in my hotel, I thought, oh, dear, okay. <laughs> oh, that is unfortunate. I mean, it could have been worse, but it was pretty funny. It could have been worse. I've been um, – we often go away for – six weeks and I need to sort of get my hair cut or coloured or whatever. Mm-hmm. And in Buenos Aires, I went into the hairdresser and it was quite a posh place. I, I think there were many more assistants in there than there would ever be in a hairdresser in Sydney. And I said, oh, well, I just want to come for an appointment and what would you like done? And I wanted him to colour my hair. But instead of colour, which is colour, I said calor, which is please, will you heat my hair for me? <laughs> so that was rather embarrassing. Fortunately, he sort of looked to scan. So, oh, oh, no, got that wrong. Better change that one. <laughs> and then, you know, it's a good excuse to talk to your hairdresser in, in the language that you're trying to learn. So we're chatting a bit and we're struggling, both of us, he with my English, with his English and me with my Spanish. And he asked me how old I was. It's kind of quite normal in Spain it appears that they ask how old you are right anyway I told him I was 500 years old (laughs) (laughs) whoops so that's one way to learn your numbers is to make mistakes (laughs) yes I guess you've never made that mistake again (laughs) no that's right yeah (laughs) Oh, that's excellent. But good on you because you never improve if you don't give it a go, do you? And this is exactly how you learn your language, by by trying it out in as many opportunities as you can. Yeah, no, that's right. That's that's exactly right. Well, Joanne may have had some language difficulties, but at least she's got some funny stories to tell after her Spanish travels So, uh, and South American too, I must add. Anyway, my final guest today is also having some Spanish issues. I'd like to introduce Queen D. Michelle's. She's also new to the Thoughtful Travel podcast, and we had a great chat recently. Uh, she recently moved to live um, and uh, retire to Mexico, 
and has all sorts of uh, interesting stories to tell as well. Um, but today it's about some Spanish language difficulties that she had not long after she moved to Mexico. I started once I realized that, you know, I was moving to Mexico, you know, I started diligently, you know, trying to uh, learn the language, Mm -hmm. you know, the basics so I can, you know, get through. So I made a commitment to study. I, um, of course, I'm I'm sure you've heard of Duolingo. Yes, I love Duolingo. Okay, I do too, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's great. So Duolingo was one. I also um, had a chance to, it's a a program, it's it's sort of like Rosetta Stone, Uh but it's called Penciler. And um, that helps with, see, I think Duolingo is more for vocabulary. Yes. You know, you really to learn words. Yeah, this, or if you've uh, already known a language to kind of revise it, like I've used it for that, and then it's quite good. But I think to, to start a language and learn the foundations well, you need something else as well. Oh, absolutely. So along with that, Penciler helped with the, the pronunciation mm-hmm. and um, the speaking because it, it had you mm. speak back. Right. quite a bit. And then I had an online uh, that helped with grammar. Right. So between grammar, speaking it and learning the vocabulary, those three um, I was really into and in studying before I moved here. However, it takes a while to mm. learn. It really, yeah, <laughs> I, language is really much harder than we think. Yeah. <laughs> right. So here I am. Uh, I'm six days in. And I walk to Walmart, which happens to be just 10 minutes from me. And I'm so proud of myself because I'm going through, it's such a beautiful day and I'm going through Walmart and I'm talking to my daughter on the phone and, you know, I'm, I'm showing her uh, different labels and things in the, <laughs> in the Mexican Walmart and how different it is. And, you know, I'm having a good time and uh, I go ahead and I check out and I, and I step out uh, of Walmart because I had noticed that they do have cat, you know, uh, a couple of taxis are always sitting outside uh-huh. and they also have men who wash your cars, car washers mm-hmm. who literally when go in Walmart, they'll wash your car for you. Ah, okay. And and one of them, he looked at me, he said, taxi. And, you know, I just nodded. Yes. And he called one over and uh, got in and I, I just live up the street, but I had groceries. So he brought me back and, uh, I had to open the gate. I needed, you know, the remote. So I had to walk in, get the remote, open the gate for him. Anyway, so he, you know, brings my groceries in. I pay him. It's, everything's wonderful, right? And he <laughs> leaves and, and I start put, putting my groceries up and I said, where's my phone? Oh, no. And of course, I looked everywhere, tore the house up, and and it hit me like a ton ton of bricks. I left my phone in the back seat of that taxi. Oh no, I did. Now remember, Walmart's just up the street. Yeah. Well, but now I, you know, I'm dashing out to run back up to Walmart, you know, to try to catch this this taxi driver. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I get back up there and th- there's the group of men and I'm trying to tell them that I left my phone in the back seat and nothing's coming out. Mm-hmm. Nothing. I mean, you, t- I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pointing, I'm, I'm doing sign language. I'm holding my hand up to my phone. No, gone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And especially when you're under stress like that, it's even I'm worse and everything stress. disappears from your brain. Here. and. Yeah, I've only been here six days, yes. and that's my phone. Yes, you know, it's like a now lifeline remember, these days. Your phone is yeah, as everything. Yeah, as is everything. Now remember, Amanda, my things weren't here either. Oh, true. Yes, you know? yes, yes. So now I'm here. You know, six days in, I don't have my things, and I don't have a phone. And um, <sighs> so literally one of them kind of understood what I was saying. And he asked me for my uh, phone number. He was going to call it, you know? So now he doesn't understand my numbers. You know, I'm trying to say, you know, so who who understands the numbers, right? (laughs) So, Oh, it it was, it it was a terrible thing. Um, What wind up happening, honestly, is just, I just bust out. I was crying like, in front of all of, you know, in front of these men, in front of people walking by, just bawling like a baby. You you know, I I was humiliated. I was scared. I was, Mm. (laughs) 
Um, that was a huge hiccup. Uh, and because of the language, you know, because of not knowing the language. And that's something that's uh, when you're in a stress situation, the only thing in your learning language mm. is not going to come to you very easily. That's so true. You know, the, the words. Uh, long story short, I never did receive my phone back. Oh, you no. know. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it was gone. So I, I came back home defeated. Oh. My tablet wrong. Ah. I didn't have my phone. But you still had your but tablet. I all about the fact I had a tablet. Ah. I had a tablet. And and with that, then I was able to contact my daughter, have her contact. You know, we we so did three fun. ways mm-hmm. to yeah. But just imagine had I, if I didn't have that tablet. Yes, that would have been then very difficult. If you've got no oh, kind I, of communication I know, means. I know at this point, at, at this point, what would have happened? Yeah. Six days in. Yes, you don't have friends no. to help you out. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. 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 Gosh, yeah, we rely on these things a lot now, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Google uh, Translate. I still go yes. in the store sometimes, and if I'm looking for something, I'll just type it in and show it to them. <laughs> Oh, why then, not? Absolutely. Right away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then you find the thing you want. Absolutely. Yeah. I lived overseas for many years when there was no um, smartphones or Google Translate. And, oh, what did you do? Uh, well, I, I came home either with nothing quite often or with completely <laughs> the wrong thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Like these days, yeah, it's so much simpler. So. The wrong thing. Yeah. Oh, I, do. I used to have the funny, especially once you want something that's a little bit not the not the usual um, oh, just a little bit off. Yes. And, and to you, it's so simple. I don't even know how to sign this to you or exactly. demonstrate it or draw it. Or it becomes a game of charades almost. Oh, you it's, know? it's crazy <laughs> sometimes. I remember I was, I don't remember why I needed it when I lived in Germany. And I spoke quite good German because I'd studied German all through school and university. Oh, but wow. I needed to get some, um, some Velcro. Do you guys call it Velcro oh, in the States? See? Yes, we yeah. do. Velcro. Okay. Exactly. Um, and I didn't know the German word and, I, oh gosh, maybe I didn't even have the internet to be able to check, to like to try and translate it before I left or it wasn't in my dictionary. That's for sure. Um, oh, cause it was okay. you know, like yeah. one of those words that didn't exist when my dictionary was made or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. And I was just, you know, so I was in a kind of a, like a fabric store that had zips and things. And I thought, you know, surely this is the shop oh, that's going to sure. have it. And, you know, trying to explain it, even though I had quite passable German, but trying to explain what this stuff was. Um, <sighs> and, um, it took me, I don't know, eventually, <laughs> eventually, um, she found something. I was like, oh my goodness. Yes, that's it. But like it, so oh. many things. And, oh, I remember to this day the German word for it. I'll never forget it now. Of but of course, course I've never right? needed it since. But, um, you yeah. see? <laughs> but it's those kind of things that are very tricky to try and, um, try and explain in another language. So, you know, if you can use something like Google Translate, then I think it saves so much hassle. Ah, <sighs> what can I say? Language difficulties make good stories, I guess. That's the best and most positive way to look at them. And we learn a lot from those uh, incidents too. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to episode 126 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. If you've thought of any of your own language difficulty stories, I'd love you to share them in our Facebook group. So head along to Thoughtful Travelers on Facebook. There's a link in the show notes, or you can just search for Thoughtful Travelers and you'll find us there. Uh, thank you very much to our great sponsor, Awesome Maps. Don't forget that you can find them at awesome-maps.com and use the discount code AMANDA15 to get a 15% discount. Thank you very much to Dean, and you can find Dean at Unbelievable Adventures. His website is unbelievableadventures.co.uk. Uh, also, thanks to Joanne. You can find her at travelwithjoanne.com. And lastly, I chatted with Queen D. Michelle, and she has a new book out. Uh, it's called Considerations, A Guide for Moving Abroad, and you can find it on Amazon, and I'll leave a link in the show notes for that as well. The show notes for today's episode are at notaballerina.com slash 126. Thank you very, very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.